All right, so Pastor Tom and Pastor Kim are in Mexico on a little vacation. They're getting a break, so that's great for them. Um, but we're continuing with the series, Happily Ever After. It takes a lot of hard work. And how many of you know that that's true? That's the truth. Like, we have this, this Disney uh, image that, it, well, it's happily ever after. Once you find the right person, it's happily ever after. But that is not reality, right? It takes a lot of hard work. And so today, I want to talk about how we apply a commitment to love in our relationships. And I, I don't just want to talk about our marriages. I, I also want to talk about friendships and relationships with your parents and relationships with your kids. Because I've been thinking about this message a lot over the last couple of weeks and just seeing the events of this week with the shooting in, in Florida. And how many of you know that our world needs God's love? Amen. Our world is so desperately in need of his love. And so today we're going to be talking about having commitment to love. Committed to love is the name of our sermon. And so, like I said, this, this commitment to love applies to all of our relationships. Marriages, yes, but, but all of our relationships. And, and God really epitomizes and displays this commitment to love beautifully and flawlessly. If you think about it, the Bible says that all, all, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, in spite of all that, in spite of our sin, in spite of our disobedience at times, in spite of our failures, God loves us. God loves us, and we don't deserve it, but he is committed to love us. He's committed to love us. And so the question that I want to ask today as we start off is, how do we apply that kind of love in our own relationships? If God loves us with this incredible love, how do we, and even can we, apply that kind of love in our own relationships? And I would say that not only is it possible, but that's our calling. That's our calling. Listen to this. John 13, 34 through 35 says, A new command I give you. Listen. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And that is the standard we're called to. Amen? Hey, so first service was kind of like sleeping. So you guys are off to the same start. So we got to we got to pick it up a little bit. We got Red Bull out in the lobby. No, we don't. But But anyways, okay. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So by a show of hands, and this is where you lift your hands and participate with the sermon, okay? By a show of hands, how many of you in here have a difficult time loving people all of the time? I see those hands. There's some of you who are just awesome at loving people. Good for you. Uh, so uh, let's be honest. It's hard to love people all the time. When circumstances don't go smoothly, it's hard to love people. For example, I might go through an entire day without somebody making fun of the Patriots or my favorite sports teams. And, I mean, sometimes I might go through an entire drive to work without somebody driving like a crazy person. So when the circumstances are great, it's easy to love people. But the minute somebody steps one toe out of line, it becomes really tough to love people, right? Listen, when my Patriots lost in the Super Bowl, you wouldn't believe the amount of hateful text messages that I got. <laughs> hateful emails, hateful Facebook posts. So many people were just trying to get at me, and I know they meant well, and they were just trying to be funny, but they don't realize how seriously I take this stuff, <laughs> which is probably something else I need to work on, Lord Jesus. So my flesh wanted to lash out. My flesh wanted to say something like, well, you know what? Maybe one day your football team that you support will be good enough that you care more about them winning than you care about my team losing. <laughs> Probably not, but maybe. Man. And I'm going to confess to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll confess that my flesh got the better of me several times. And in those moments, in those moments when it's difficult to love, that's when we need to think about the love that God has shown us. We don't deserve it. We haven't done anything to deserve it, but he pours it out on us day after day. His mercies are new every morning, and he never stops loving us. Amen? Do we deserve God's love? Nope. We haven't earned it. We don't deserve it. Do people deserve our love? Even the crazy ones. Yep. Especially the crazy ones. Yeah. So our calling is, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. When we choose to love, whether it's our spouses or a friend or a relative, we show the love of God. So how many of you in here are parents? 
Yeah, okay, we got a lot of parents in here. So when your kids were little, like it made you feel really good. And probably as they grow, it makes you feel really good when somebody says to you, you know what, your, your kid is starting to look a lot like you or your child has your eyes or your child has your smile. That's a good feeling for a parent. Like I have two boys, George and Oliver, and it makes me, they, they both look more like their mom, I think. But, but sometimes somebody will say to me, you know, George is starting to look more like you or Oliver is starting to look more like you. And that makes me feel so good as a parent, right? Can you guys, parents, relate to that? And so I want you to think about this. Our Father is the perfect example of love. In fact, the Bible says that God is love. And we're the sons and daughters of God. We're the sons and daughters of love. And so when we love in the way that he displayed for us, think about this. We look like our Father. We look like our Father, and that makes him happy. Amen? That blesses our Father. Just like somebody saying to you, you know, your child is starting to look like you. Well, when we look like our Father, it makes him so proud. It makes him so proud. John 13, 35 that we read earlier says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We reflect God in our love. When we love others, we look like our Father. So this morning, I want to talk about how we apply this commitment to love to our close relationships in our lives, our marriages, friendships, family, and so on. But first, we're going to play a game. Who likes games? What? Okay. All right. So here's what I need. Ushers, if you guys would come help me with those, those uh, whatever those are called, tables. Yeah, that's a big word. Um, tables. That's it. Okay. So I need uh, a, a volunteer, actually two volunteers, a couple. You don't have to be married, but a husband or wife or a dating relationship. Where are you at? Anybody? Anybody, any, oh, right there, Colbert, come on. Devin and Jessica, let's give them a hand. Let's give them a hand. Okay. Uh, Jessica, you come right over here. Devin, you're going to come over here, good sir. Come on, let's give them a bigger hand. Let's give them a bigger hand. Okay, come over here. All right, so here's the game. You guys have 30 seconds to build a tower out of these blocks, as high as you can, but you can't build like a big base at the bottom. You have to build one on top of the other. You can do it sideways or, or long ways, but the goal is to build the highest tower that you can in 30 seconds. Yeah, one at a time, one at a time. One has to be laying on top of the other. So clear all that, knock them all down. I'm not going to touch them, but you go, uh, okay. So we got 30 seconds, 30 seconds on the clock. Hang on, let me play some, some music. We'll just kick it back into that song. Here we go. Go! 30 seconds. <sighs> Devin, you're struggling, man. This is intense. Oh, no, nah, it's not going to work. Hmm. Jessica's crushing you. What's happening? Why is she why is she so much better at this than you? Oh. <laughs> wow. All right, you got five seconds left. Five, four, three, two. What you got it? Hands off, hands off. Oh, okay, that's game over. Game over. Let's give him a hand, everybody. Give him a hand. Great job. Oh, what happened? Oh, is it crooked? Yeah. Is it crooked? Wow, I had no idea that that was crooked. <laughs> hey, we got a we got a twenty-five dollar cheesecake gift card for you guys. Okay, you gotta share it though. Okay, yeah. Can you guys get that off for me? Thank you so much. So yes, his table was crooked. Okay, his table was is leaning like this, so it's pretty much impossible to build on that. And so I want you to see that, though. I want you to see that this table is level. It's solid foundation. It's a level surface. That table over there is not. And so the first thing I want you to write down this morning is that if we're going to be committed to love, we have to make God our first priority. That's our foundation. Make God our first priority. First, we have to have the foundation in place, and the foundation is our relationship with God. So we make God our first priority. Matthew 22, 36 through 39 says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So if we're truly going to be committed to loving others, we have to be committed to love, and God is love, like we said. So we must be committed to God first, and once we get that right, we have the capacity to love others. But Devin, was, you were struggling over here, man. You were struggling. Like, you got one or two up, but they were falling over. Without God as our foundation, as our first priority, we can't love others on our own. You might get a block up, you might get two blocks up, but eventually it's going to come crashing down. It can't be sustained without that foundation in place. 
we put God first, amen, church? And then we can love others. The next thing that I want to talk about is this. First, we make God our, our, our first priority. The next thing in our relationships, we need to do our best to keep no records of wrong. Keep no records of wrong. Who here struggles with this one? I got both hands raised. Not that my wife ever does anything wrong, because she doesn't, but what? <laughs> 1 <laughs> Corinthians 13.5, talking about love here, it says, Love, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Mm. Maybe you're here today, and you're holding on to unforgiveness from a hurt in your past. Maybe you're here today, and somewhere in your life along the way, somebody has hurt you physically or emotionally, and it still, to this day, it impacts your ability to love others. If we're going to be committed to love, we have to be willing to forgive the wrongs that others have done to us. And I get that it's easier said than done, but think about this. It's like, it's like trying to swim the length of a pool with a 100-pound weight tied to your legs. You can kick your arms, and you can, you can flail around, but you're not going anywhere. If we can't let go of unforgiveness, we're not going to have the capacity to love others fully the way that God wants us to. And so if you're here this morning and you're struggling with unforgiveness, or you're struggling with letting go from a hurt, of a hurt from your past, I just want to pray this morning. Is that okay? You don't have to raise your hand or anything like that, but I'm just going to pray for you right now. Father, we thank you that you are calling us to love others, and you're calling us to let go of, of the, the hurts that, that have been put on us. And Lord, we know that, that people are not perfect, and that as long as we're alive, Lord, people are going to be making mistakes, and we're going to be making mistakes. But Lord, we thank you for showing us right now that love keeps no record of wrongs, and that we're called to forgive others. We're called to love others fully and completely, because we know, Lord, that we don't deserve it, but you love us. So we ask you to help us love others, Lord even the ones who haven't asked for forgiveness, even the ones who don't deserve it, especially the ones who don't deserve it, Lord. You're calling us to forgive and to love. So I ask that you would help us with that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. So forgiveness plays a big role in not keeping any record of wrong, but that's not all there is to it. There's more to it than that. It's easy, in a, even if your relationship is going great, it's easy to hold on to little things, little things, and those little things kind of build and build and build, and then eventually in a heated moment, they boil over. Pastor Tom and Kim mentioned this last week with, with fighting fair and dealing with conflict about getting historical, like saying in a, when, when you're in an argument, well, oh, really? Yeah, well, I remember back 12 years ago when you didn't take the trash out and I told you to. Like, that's not helpful to a, to a, to a conversation. For example, this is a theoretical example, okay? My wife might say to me, Colin, could you please quit farting under the blankets? The sound and the smell keep waking me up and I can't deal with it anymore. Theoretical. This is not a real example. Or maybe it is. You'll never know. <laughs> My response could be, you know what, Vanessa, I'm not the one who cooked dinner tonight, and I don't know what you put in that soup, but it's clearly not agreeing with me. This is on you, not me. This is your fault. <laughs> Again, totally theoretical. Or a more serious example, you could say to your spouse something like, honey, could you please not bring work home with you so often? I just want to spend some time with you. And your spouse could respond with, well, maybe if you didn't spend so much time on your phone looking at emails or the news or Pinterest or sports or the stock market or Snapchat or whatever, listen, being defensive brings a dead end to a conversation. And we don't want to do that. We want to leave lines of communication open and we want to work with each other. When you're the one bringing something up, I also want to say this, when you're the one who's bringing correction, do it in love. Do it in love and do it thoughtfully. Don't do it reactionally. If something just happened that upset you, don't do it reactionally. Think about what you want to say and think about how to deliver that in love so that it's well received. Because if you say something and you bring correction and anger or frustration, it's probably not going to be said in love. And it's probably not going to be received with love either. So it's important not to keep records of wrong and it's important to do our best to listen and not get defensive. Speak in love and listen in humility. So who is familiar with Moses from the Old Testament? Moses, a great leader, one of the greatest leaders of, of the Bible. And there's a great story about him in Exodus 18. So Moses has just led the Israelites out of Egypt. God did signs and wonders and miracles, and he led the people out of Egypt. They, they split the Red Sea. God split the Red Sea, and Moses led the people through it, and God delivered them. And so at this point in the story, Moses and the Israelites are in the wilderness. 
And Jethro is Moses' father-in-law. And Jethro sends word to Moses. He says, Moses, I'm going to come visit with you. And so at this time, Moses had been sitting as judge to all of Israel. So picture this. All day long, these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Israelites bring Moses their problems day after day, a wide array of problems. And they bring these problems to Moses. And it's up to Moses to say, okay, this is what we're going to do in this situation. This is what you're going to do. And it's all on Moses. Moses is dealing with all of these issues day after day. And so Moses, uh, Moses has this visitor, his father-in-law, Jethro, and Jethro visits, and Jethro starts to observe the way that Moses is leading, and Jethro is uncovering some flaws in Moses' leadership, and Jethro confronts Moses about it. Jethro says, Moses, this is way too much work for any one man. You can't do this all by yourself. And so Jethro really tears apart the way that Moses is leading the Israelites, and, and Moses just led the people out of Egypt Moses just led the people through the Red Sea, and here's Jethro, and Jethro's coming, and he's telling Moses that he's doing it all wrong. Moses could have responded in one of two ways. He could have responded like Moses, uh, like Jethro, Jethro, hey, people know me. I'm kind of a big deal, all right? Have you seen what I've done? I'm sure you've heard the stories. I just raised my staff, and I watched God split the Red Sea. Look, thanks for your visit. Thanks for your ideas, but I'm good. Or he could have responded the way he did. He humbled himself, and he listened to some great godly advice. The Bible says Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. And listen, when you humble yourself and you listen to advice, godly advice, it helps you become a better follower of Christ. In this scenario, it helped Moses to become the leader that he was called to be. So don't be defensive. Don't store up ammunition to fire back at somebody when they confront you about something. And when you do bring someone correction, do it in love. Do it thoughtfully. If we're going to be committed to love, we have to forgive. We must speak in love. We must listen with humility. And that will make us stronger in our relationships and stronger in our walk with God. So the next thing I want to mention is crucial to having a commitment to love. Because this commitment to love, it's not something that we implement as a New Year's resolution in 2019. It's not something that that we're going to fire up with with a fast sometime in June. We're going to do this now. Commitment to love starts now. So that's your third point. Write that down. Start now. Start now. 1 John 3.18 says, Let us stop saying we love each other. Let us really show it by our actions. Let us stop saying we love each other. Let us really show it by our actions. Commitment goes far beyond our words. Amen? Commitment has to extend to our actions. So I have a couple little action steps that I want you to write down underneath the start now. And the first one is this. When you think something good, say it. When you think something good, you say it. When you think something good about your loved one, say it. When you see them doing something good, say it. Speak it. Build them up because it strengthens our relationships when we edify each other. But if you think that good thing, that's great. But if you don't say it to that person, it doesn't mutually build your relationship. So you think something good about someone, your spouse or your your son or your daughter or your parents or a coworker, speak it to them. And do this appropriately also, okay? All right? When you think something good, say it. Here's Here's the next one. When you think something special, do it. When you think something special, do it. This past Christmas was a whirlwind for my family. Who, who, who has crazy Christmases? It's like a never-ending cyclone of doom or something. <coughs> I just coined that phrase. Trademark it. Uh, cyclone of doom. Yep, that's not what Christmas is supposed to be, by the way. Um, but for my family, it was a tough Christmas. Um, my grandfather was 91 years old. He was in great health, but he unexpectedly passed away. Uh, back in my home in New Hampshire. And so my wife and my boys and I, we got to, we got to go visit uh, for the, the funeral service. And we went there and we visited with my family briefly. And we came back uh, to Tulsa on December 23rd. And that was a Saturday night. We got back in at like 11.30 at night. It was really late. The next day was, was church, Sunday morning, Christmas Eve. And it was a crazy day. And then the next day, it was Christmas. And I didn't buy a single present. And I was, I was, yeah, it just snuck up on me. And so, so that, that morning, Christmas morning, Vanessa, my wife, comes out with presents for the boys and a present for me. And I'm like, oh, no, because <laughs> I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything for my wife. And so I was like, listen, hon, can we just kind of push this back a couple days so I can go get you something? And one thing I love, uh, We don't go over the top for Christmas, but we always get each other a little something nice just to to let each other know that we love each other. But 
So I dropped the ball is the long and the short of the story. I dropped the ball, and I didn't get my wife anything. And so I, I, I stalled. I was like, let's wait a couple of days. Let's figure this out. Give me a few days. I'll get something. And so in spite of my tardiness, I started to think of what I could do to make my wife feel special. And if you don't know my wife, she's super easygoing. She wouldn't have cared if I got her anything. I could have, you know, I could have sang her a song, and she would have laughed at me, and that would have been good. But she's easygoing. But I was like... I dropped the ball, so I have to make up for this. I have to do something special to make her feel loved. I, she doesn't like it when I sing to her. Do you? Do you want me to sing to you right now? Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> mm, I can't think of anything right now. We're going we're gonna to carry on. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble later, so I'm trying to cover all my bases. All right. But I started to think about what can I do to make up for not getting any presents for my wife for Christmas. So in my mind, I couldn't just do something that I normally do. I had to step up my game because I'm in the doghouse right now. Not really, but in my mind, I, I dropped the ball. I got to make up for it. And so we have this rule with Vanessa and I that I am never allowed to buy her clothes. I'm not allowed to buy her clothes because I've done it before and it has not gone well. And so, so we have this rule. You're not buying me clothes. Just get me a gift card or something. So yeah, okay. So I went to a couple of her favorite stores. I got her a couple of gift cards. And I was like, okay, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, that's kind of lame, gift cards, but it's better than nothing. So I'm thinking about what else can I do for my wife? And so I got her a couple little knickknacks, like some stocking stuff for ideas. And I was like, okay, I'm getting closer. Not quite there yet. And so I'm sitting in my office upstairs here at church and I'm thinking to myself, like, what can I do for my wife? I want to make her feel special. I dropped the ball. I got to make up for it somehow. What can I do? And then I had this great idea, <laughs> clearly a God idea. I can write her a poem. I know, I hear that, yeah, yeah, smooth move, right, smooth move, and so I sat down, and I started writing her a poem, and it started off cheesy, but it ended up being something more heartfelt, and I gave it to her, that was the last present I gave to her on Christmas, and it, or, or on our Christmas, like a week later, uh, <laughs> New Year's Eve, whatever it was, last week, uh, no, but, but I gave it to her, and that ended up being her favorite gift that I got for her, and so, yeah, oh, thank you, yeah. Remember that, honey, yeah. <laughs> so in first service, I mentioned that really at this point, I don't ever have to buy her anything again. I can just write her a poem, right? No, is that not how it works? Okay, that's not how it works. Good to know. Thank you. Appreciate your input. No, but so that, that poem ended up being her favorite thing that I did for her for Christmas. So the point is that if you think of doing something special for your loved one, do it. Do it. It goes a long way. It could, be, it could be writing a poem, or it could be something simple like doing the dishes, cleaning some pots and pans, putting the kids to bed, cleaning their car. If you think of something special to do for your loved one, do it. It goes a long way. Just let them know that you're thinking of them, that you love them. And the third thing I want you guys to write down under this is when you want something different, be it. Be it. And this one is a butt kicker. When you want something different, be it. In our relationships and in our marriages, it's so easy to point the finger or, or to internally say or think, well, if he would just do this more often, or if she would just do this more often, listen, wives, if your husbands, if you want them to be more helpful around the house, start praising them and start thanking them for what they do. Start thanking them for their contributions in your family. Instead of group texting with your girlfriends about all the dumb stuff they do, start to encourage them and build them up. I'm not saying that anybody does that, but <laughs> start to express your thanks for their role in your family. Husbands, listen husbands, if you want your wives to do certain things, <coughs> <coughs> like fill in the blank, whatever that may be, PG rated, PG-13. Now you're married, it's cool. Uh, if you want your wife to do certain things, you need to start to find a way to meet their needs, okay? Start to find a way to show them love. For example, if your wife feels loved the most from quality time, then you spend quality time with them. Even if you don't love that so much, even if that's not your top love language, you find a way to build them up, to make them feel loved. If your wife's love language is words of, of, of affirmation, thank you, then start to tell them all the things that you love about them. Don't just say, honey, I love you. Start to tell them why you love them. I love you because you sacrifice for my family. I love you because you do so much for us. I tell them why you love them. 
Wives, if you want to love your husbands, and if you know that physical touch is their love language, then guess what? Physically touch them. That's a great place to start. Be the change that you want to see in your marriage, okay? Be the change that you want to see in your relationships. You might say, well, the spark's just not there anymore. Be the change. Be the change. Well, he's not who I thought he was. Well, guess what? You might have changed too. Stop making excuses and start being the change that you want to see in your relationship. Put God first. Don't keep records of wrongs and start now. If you want something different, it starts with you. It doesn't start with the other person. It starts with you. And you can take that initiative and you can make a difference. Parents, if you want to see your kids doing something different with their lives, start to encourage them more. If you're not happy with the way they're going, don't, don't tear them down. Don't tear them down. Start to speak encouragement to their lives. Don't say things like, well, why can't you keep a job? Or why are you doing this? Why can't you apply yourself in school and do better? Start to build them up. Start to speak the potential that you see in them. And I can attest, as a 30-year-old man, my mother still does this to me to this day. And it will drive your kids crazy. But they'll start to believe it. It'll start to shape their lives. I think my mom is watching online. Sorry, mom. Love you. <laughs> but start to encourage your kids. Start to build them up. Speak the potential that you see in them. Because honestly, one way or another, your words have the power to shape your kids' future. And that doesn't just apply to your kids. That applies to your spouse. That applies to your parents. That applies to your siblings. That applies to all of our relationships. Start to speak life in your relationships. Amen? Amen. What changes do you want to see in your relationships? In your marriage? Between you and your parents? Or between you and your kids? Instead of sulking and, and getting depressed or getting angry or, or lashing out... You take the initiative. Decide today, I'm going to be the difference in my marriage. I'm going to be the difference that I want to see in my relationship. Because it's not up to the other person. It's up to you right now. And if you've been divorced or if you're going through a hard time in your relationship, this is not at all, at all intended to condemn. This whole series is geared towards looking at our current situations right now and our future relationships and trying to follow God's plan for our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. And if you're not yet married or you want to be married someday, I promise that these principles will help you in your relationships and in all of your relationships and in your future marriage as well. And I love this. I love this definition of commitment. It says this, commitment means staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood you said it in left you. Let's read that again. Commitment means staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood you said it in left you. Because my wife and I got married nine plus years ago, and I'm certain that the mood that we set our vows in on that day are different than the mood that we're in right now or the mood that we'll be in in a couple days. Listen, we're going to go through different circumstances. We're going to go through different challenges, and it's not always going to be pretty. It's not always going to be easy. Relationships take hard work, right? but we stay loyal to the commitment that we made long after the mood that we said those commitments in has left us. Amen? We commit to love each other. Commitment means that you choose to love that person. You make the choice that you're going to love even if you don't feel like it in the moment. And like we said, there are plenty of times that we don't feel like loving people but we choose to love them anyways. So in order for us to have this commitment to love, I want to end today just by going over three more commitments to make that work hand in hand with this commitment to love each other, okay? And number one is this. Number one is this. I commit to work with you. I commit to work with you. I commit to work with you. Ephesians 4.2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Listen, we show humility in our relationships, gentleness, patience, compassion, sometimes long-suffering. That's okay. Our relationships require work, and we make every effort not just to maintain our relationships, not just to keep them holding on by a thread, but to nurture our relationships and to grow our relationships by watering the grass where we are. Pastor Tom talked about this a few weeks ago, not looking at somebody else's scenario or not looking at another situation and saying, like, well, boy, that sure looks good right now. No, you water the grass where you are. You water the grass where you are, and you nurture your relationships. And Lord, we believe that you have the power to restore relationships and to heal relationships and to mend hearts in Jesus' name. I look around this room today, and I know that many of you have gone through difficulties in your relationships. And I know that some of you are going through that right now. 
But I do believe that God is a healing God, amen? amen? I do believe that he can restore what's broken. And this is not meant to condemn or tear down at all. This is intended to help you find hope today. And if you have a failed marriage for whatever reason, or failed marriage is for whatever reason, you can apply these truths from this moment moving forward, amen? God can restore your heart. He can restore your ability to love. Not to love in the, the way the world sees love, but to love in the way that God sees love. With an unconditional love. He can heal you. So we move forward, and we don't look at the past. We learn from the past, but we move forward. Amen? Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. I'm thankful for friends like that. For a wife like that. The next one is this, I commit to sacrifice for you. I commit to sacrifice for you. 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So my wife had the flu this week. I went home early from church last Sunday because she was starting to feel a little under the weather. And so I went home, and, and she was out of commission for several days. And it is hard to be a stay-at-home parent. It's hard to be a stay-at-home parent and take care of your wife who's not feeling very good. And she wasn't high maintenance, so I appreciate that. But there were times when I was wondering, like, how many times can a one-year-old poop in a single day? <laughs> because I lost count, and it was, it was crazy. Furthermore, our, our almost three-year-old is potty training right now. So there, was, there were some very adventurous moments throughout the course of the week. <laughs> And I was, I was thinking about it, and I, at times I was getting overwhelmed, and I was feeling frustrated because I also knew that I had to preach this message Sunday, and I've got a lot of work to do. I've got a lot on my plate, but yeah, this message, I commit to sacrifice for you. I knew I was preaching on this point. And so as I'm changing the 33rd dirty diaper of the day, I'm thinking to myself, I commit to sacrifice for you. I commit to sacrifice for you. And the more I thought about it, the more I began to realize and understand the sacrifices that my wife makes for me and for my family every single day. And I'm so grateful for that. I commit to sacrifice for you. At times it's difficult. Like it was difficult for me when Vanessa was out of commission for a few days, but the Lord reminded me that love sacrifices for others and it doesn't think twice about it. It's easy to slip into a mentality of me, 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 me in our relationships. To think about ourselves. To think about what can I get out of this or why isn't this going the way I want it to or why is this so hard for me right now? In reality, we need to take the focus off of ourselves, okay? If you want a healthy relationship, start to make sacrifices for your loved ones. And you might say to me this morning, you might say to me, Colin, I've been making sacrifices for my loved one for the last 20 years. They just don't notice. Here's what I would say. They do notice. And I would say keep doing it. Keep doing it. And do it as an act of love. Don't do it as, as a way to get a pat on the back or, or a thank you or appreciation. Just do it as an act of love. Do it because you love that person. Don't look for something in return. Lay down your life for your spouse, for your kids, for your friends. Sacrificial love, that can mean so many things. It can mean staying home and, and changing diapers and taking care of the kids, but it can mean so many things. If you're the one who usually cooks or if your spouse is the one who usually cooks, you volunteer and say, hey, I'll take a turn. Don't burn the house down, but you can take a turn. Love them and don't look for something in return. If our relationships, listen to this, if our relationships are entirely about how do they serve me, what am I getting out of this, what can I get out of this, if that's your mindset and your relationship, your relationship is never going to be fulfilling as much as it could be. We put the focus on the other person. Love is about what we give just as much as it is about what we get. And the ultimate example of that love is Jesus who gave his life for us, who literally went to hell and back for us, out of love for you, just to be with you. I commit to sacrifice for you. And the last one is this. I commit to love you unconditionally. I commit to love you unconditionally. 1 John 4, 9 through 11. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. And this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. Like we said earlier, 
a new command I give you, love one another. That's what we're called to do. You might say to me this morning, well, Colin, you don't know what my father was like, or you don't know what my mother was like, or you don't know how my siblings treated me when I was younger. How am I supposed to love them? You don't know the circumstances of my marriage. You don't know what I've been through. And I would say that you're right. I don't know all those things, but I do know that God heals and restores, and he knows every situation, every circumstance, every valley that you walk through. He knows it, and he sees it, and he's with you the whole way. Amen? Amen. Like we said, sometimes circumstances make it easier to love, and sometimes circumstances make it harder to love, but here is our calling, no matter what we walk through, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And I want to end this morning just with with a kind of a charge for us because I've seen in church circles so many times people isolated because of their past or maybe because of their current or because of situa- or decisions that they're making right now. And sometimes we as church people, we say, whoa, I don't want anything to do with that. I'm not going to show that person love. There's a great story about Zacchaeus. Who knows Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and Zacchaeus stole from his own people, and he took more money than he was entitled to take, and he took it for himself. He was selfish. He was greedy. He was prideful. He was arrogant. But one day in the town of Jericho where Zacchaeus lived, Jesus came through town. And Jesus, of course, knew about Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was, was intrigued by Jesus. And so Zacchaeus climbs up this, the sycamore tree to get a better view of Jesus because Zacchaeus is a little dude. And so there's Zacchaeus up on the tree looking for Jesus, trying to spot him, trying to spot him. And then Jesus sees Zacchaeus. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down here. And so the religious people around, they're, they're expecting, you know, Jesus is going to condemn this guy. Jesus is going to, he's going to teach him a lesson. But Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house tonight. I'm coming to your house tonight. Here's Jesus, the Messiah, <laughs> the perfect son of God, going to spend dinner and the evening with a sinner. And so the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they start to mumble around themselves and murmur, like, what is Jesus doing? How can he do this? This guy is a sinner. That is the example and the standard of love that we are called to, church. That's the standard of love that we're called to. So it's not, it's not about, well, well, this person is, they're living in sin right now. I can't, I can't spend time with them. Or, or I've seen this so many times in families, even in my own family at times. Well, this person, you know, this person is doing this right now. They're, they're, maybe they're being unfaithful. Maybe they're, maybe they're living a homosexual lifestyle. Maybe they're doing this. Listen, it is not our job to condemn them. It is not our job to cut them off and to isolate them. Our job is to love them with the everlasting love of God. And here, here's something else. I want to say this because we do believe in the Bible. We believe in scripture. We believe in what Jesus says is right and wrong. We believe in what the Bible says is right and wrong. But our standard of love is that as Jesus has loved us, so we must love others. And who here is perfect, right? Nobody. We don't deserve God's love, but he pours it out. He pours it out. He pours it out. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to cut off those lines of communication. We're not called to isolate people. We're not called to isolate friends. We're not called to shun them or turn our backs from them. Because listen, Tom says it all the time. (sighs) Jesus can walk across that bridge from our heart to theirs, and that can change a life. But if we cut those relationships off, there's no bridge there. We have to maintain those relationships. We have to show love, unconditional love. We don't pass judgment. We don't, we don't condemn. We don't say, listen, I can't be your friend anymore. I understand that we need to have boundaries, and we need to have, have good boundaries in our relationships. But listen, we don't stop loving people because we disagree with their lifestyle. We continue to love them, and we show them the unconditional love of God. Amen. Yes. Amen. And that is what has the power to change hearts and to change lives. But if we cut that off, who knows? We have to maintain those relationships. We have to show love to people and not judgment. Amen? Amen. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you that you're calling us to love one another as you loved us. Lord, that you're calling us to sacrifice, to lay down our lives for our friends, for our families, for our loved ones, for our spouse, for our children. And Lord, we thank you for showing us the perfect example of love. Lord, love that doesn't put itself first, love that doesn't keep a record of wrong, but love that is relentless, that is unconditional, that's unwavering and unchanging. Lord, we thank you for that love. 
We thank you for calling us to that standard. And Father, I ask that you would help us in this place. If we're dealing with unforgiveness or if we're dealing with anger or if we're dealing with hurt, whatever it may be, Lord, we give those things to you right now. And we ask supernaturally, Holy Spirit, that you would help us. If you're here right now, just, just lift up your hands right now as a sign of surrender to the Lord. Come on, just lift up your hands, church. God, we ask that you would take us, take our hearts, take our lives, and help us to love each other. A new command I give you, love one another. Lord, let us not just say it, but let us show it by our actions. Let us show it by our actions. And everything that we say and everything that we do, help us to lay down our lives for each other and to show the love of God because we want to look like you, Lord. We want to look like you. And we know that that puts a smile on your face when we, when we show the love of our Father. So God, help us to do that. Help us not to look down our nose or to thumb our nose at people or to turn our backs on people. Lord, help us to love. And Lord, we pray for marriages in this place. Lord, we pray for restoration in Jesus' name. We pray for restoration where there's been hurt, where there's been damage. Lord, where people are, are far from you, where they've turned their backs from you. Lord, we pray for restoration in Jesus' name and healing in Jesus' name. Where people feel like, I can't love anymore. I, I, I've been burned one time too many. No, we know that you are a God who restores and you're a God who heals the brokenhearted. Lord, we thank you that you're here this morning. We thank you for the work that you're doing on our hearts right now, that you'll continue to do on our hearts. We thank you for calling us deeper, for calling us to a more intentional love. Help us with that charge this morning, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen.